الحمد لله وكفى وصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين استفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبع فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم سورة النحل في القرآن أن الله سبحانه وتعالى declares and we sent down the book يعني the Quran on the O Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam that this book might explain all things did you hear that? that this book might explain all things and therefore that this book might explain the strange economy around the world today in which wealth no longer circulates through the economy in which the rich are now permanently rich forever and ever and ever and the poor and now imprisoned in permanent poverty forever and ever and ever. This book will explain it. This book will explain that strange economy in which the rich grow ever richer and the masses around the world are now being imprisoned in a new slavery. This book We'll explain it. And in this book, there is guidance. How do we respond to that strange world out there? That explanation and that guidance have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as rahmah. And for those who have the good sense and the wisdom to go search for it through the hours of the night with tears in their eyes and tears in their heart. And when they find it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them with it. They accept it and they embrace it and they apply it regardless of the price they have to pay. Bushra lahum, good news and glad tidings for such people. They will understand what others cannot, not even with a PhD from the London School of Economics. They will understand what others cannot. And they will succeed when others will not. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and glorify him this night. And we beseech him most humbly for his guidance and for his blessings and for his protection. Most of all, his protection. For not all who come are friends. We beseech him for his guidance and his blessings and his protection as we attempt to address and to explain the subject Islam and money Islam and the international monetary system and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu came to the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam with a basket of dates or a sa'a of dates and offered some dates to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam He looked at the dates and he said Bilal 
These are very fine quality dates. Where did you get them? Bilal radiallahu ta'ala who replied and said, O Messenger of Allah, I had two baskets of inferior quality dates or two sa'as and I exchanged them for this one basket of superior quality dates or one sa'a of superior quality dates. That's how I got them. Bilal said the Prophet to Islam, that was the essence of riba. <coughs> now this is terrible. Because if drinking whiskey is bad, riba is worse than that. If committing zina with your next door neighbor's wife is bad, riba is worse than that. You'll excuse me if I raise my voice because I want to shake the heart sometime. This is the essence of riba. <laughs> riba, we know, is lending and borrowing money on interest. When money is lent on interest, Allah declares, that is not business. He says, Allah has made business halal and he's made riba haram. So now to understand why riba is haram, we have to find out, well, in what way are they different? Business and riba. The last man in the world to ask that question is a banker. Eh? <laughs> The difference between riba and business, of course, you understand it, that it is in the essence of a business transaction that you must embrace risk. You can either make a profit or suffer a loss. That's business. In riba, you don't have any risk. You either eliminate it or you immunize yourself from it by minimizing it. So you could only make a profit, regardless of the size of the profit, no loss. Well, what's the harm in that? The harm is that when you eliminate risk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now faced with a people who have shut the door. He told them, don't shut this door. If you shut this door, I will not open it. In Allah, la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Don't shut this door. Because if you shut it, I'm not going to open it. Which door? The door to risk. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can now cause some to suffer loss and others to get a gain. So he can distribute wealth and he can redistribute wealth so that wealth will circulate through the economy. But now when that door is shut, when an economy is based on riba, lending and borrowing on interest, the rich will now remain permanently rich and the poor will remain permanently poor. If you still not understood, this book will help you. It took me four years to write it, The Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah. And this one will help you to muster up the courage to read a bigger one. The importance of the prohibition of riba in Islam. But there is another form of riba. If you meet a man coming to the market to sell his goods, and you buy his goods from him before he could enter into the market. And when he entered into the market, he finds out that he could have gotten a better price in the market. That's riba. Why? You exploited his ignorance of the market price to get a profit or a gain greater than that to which you were entitled. Hmm? The Americans describe this with a very pretty phrase. They say, you ripped him off. <laughs> That's riba. Namely, a transaction based on deception through which 
you get a profit or a gain or an advantage to which you are not justly entitled. Riba. Tonight, we're going to be spending some time on this second kind of riba. So the Prophet said, Bilal, this is the essence of riba. What you should have done, what you should have done is to sell the two baskets. Don't look at me, don't look at him. Sell the two baskets of inferior quality dates and take that money and buy the one basket of superior quality dates. And so they had equal value, equal value. And so it was haram to exchange two baskets of dates for one. It was riba. But uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu exchanged four camels for one. And that was not haram. Why was this haram and that not haram? And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu exchanged 20 camels for one. These 20 may have been baby camels. And this one may have been a pregnant camel. And there was not haram. So the question we ask tonight is, why was it haram to exchange two baskets of dates for one? And there was riba. But it was not haram to exchange four camels for one or 20 camels for one. That's a good question, isn't it? You're lucky I don't have the time to question you tonight. To answer that question, we must go to another hadith. And you've all heard this hadith before, all of you. It is in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam is describing a transaction in which there is an exchange of gold for gold, or silver for silver, or wheat for wheat, or barley for barley, or dates for dates, this is the one, dates for dates, or salt for salt. And he is declaring, once it is like for like, it must be equal for equal. Two baskets on this side, you must have two baskets on this side. If not, it is riba. Why is it riba? Remind me to answer that question if I forget. Why would it be riba? If I exchange two baskets of dates for one, why? Before we answer that question, and also remind me, because I forget, you know, remind me to answer the question, why is the four camels for one not riba? Okay. When we look at this hadith, there are six items mentioned. Two of them are precious metals, gold and silver, and the other four may be described as commodities. What is there which is common to all six of them? There are two things which are common to all six of them. The first is this that all six were used as money in the market, in Medina. If there was a shortage of gold and silver coins, they would use dates as money in Medina. Hmm? The second thing which is common to all six, which the Prime Minister of Malaysia has only now understood when the sun is already setting huh? is that in all six <laughs> in, all, 
in all six, the value of the money is in the money. In other words, in all six, the money had intrinsic value. I heard with my own ears the Prime Minister of Malaysia say a few years ago, of course, he's going to be embarrassed now to re be reminded of it. He said, money has no intrinsic value. Now, he's backpedaling <laughs> because now he's beginning to learn a little thing from us who are teaching the subject for years now. And so the two things which are common are, number one, all six were used as money. And number two, in every case, the money had intrinsic value. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to Sunnah money. You never heard of it before. You heard about the Sunnah, it's the bed. You heard about Sunnah, Salat. But you never heard about sunnah money before. First time. What is sunnah money? Sunnah money is either precious metals or commodities. And sunnah money is money which has intrinsic value. I leave behind me two things. So long as you hold on to them, you will never go astray. The book of Allah and my sunnah. And this is also his sunnah. And we've abandoned it today. This is riba. We will explain to you how it is riba. We've abandoned what we had as sunnah money and replaced it with riba. We'll explain to you how. But wait a minute. This money, which is Sunnah money, is it also in the Quran? I mean, did we abandon the Quran as well? Oh, that would be terrible. So let's go to the Quran and see. When Yusuf alayhi salam was in the well, you're shaking your head? Okay, he was in the well. The travelers came, fished him out of the well, and they took him to Egypt and they sold him. Surah Yusuf. Washarauhu bithamanin bachsin darahima ma'aduda. And they sold him for a few measly dirhams. What is this word dirham? A dirham is a silver coin, precious metals. And then there is this ayah also in the Quran, in Surah to Ali Imran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the double standards of the Jews. And remember, it is not Imran Hussein who is speaking, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if they want to arrest anyone, they will have to arrest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let him try to do that now. And amongst the Ahlul Kitab, here it is the Jews, they are those who, if you entrust them with a kintar, 1,200 gold coins. Huh? It's about 350,000 US dollars. Could you kindly keep this for me safely? When you want it back, they will return it to you. Why? Because you're a Jew. But amongst them, there are those who, if you give him a dinar, a gold coin, could you kindly keep this safely for me? When you want it back, you can't get it back. Illa ma dumta alayhi qa'ima. 
The only way you could get back your gold coin, your dinar, is if you stand there and you pound them and you pound them and you demand it and demand it and demand it back. Why? This is because they argue. Laysa alayna fil ummiyina sabir. We have no moral obligations to these ummiyun. We have no obligation to maintain an ethical standard with these ummiyun. Ummi, when we use the term, we understand it as one who cannot read and write, but when a Jew uses it, he uses it to mean one who is not a Jew. Gentile. وَيَكُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ Allah said, but they tell a lie against me, and they know it's a lie. And so in this ayah of the Qur'an, there is the word dinar. So sunnah money is also money in the Qur'an. Dinar is in the Quran, dirham is in the Quran, and when Allah speaks of a dinar in the Quran, I can assure you tonight, in G-I-Y-C, he's not talking about a paper dinar. He's talking about a gold coin. Sunnah money is in the Quran. I leave behind me two things. So long as you hold on to them, you will never go astray. The book of Allah, and we've abandoned it. And my sunnah, and we've abandoned it. Why now was it haram to exchange two baskets of dates for one? Why was it riba? Answer, because dates were used as money. Since dates were used as money, if we permit a transfer of one on this side and two on this side, we will open the door for money to be lent on interest. That's why. Well, then why was it halal to exchange four camels for one? Now, that's an easy question. Who can answer, answer that question for me? Yes. The four camels were male, and the one was female. No, that's not the answer. <laughs> yes? That's the answer, correct. Because camels were not used as money. Did I tell you that story about the fellow who was paid his salary? He worked for the whole month. And at the end of the month, he got his salary, and his salary was a camel. So he was taking the camel home when the camel died. <laughs> so when he reached home, he said to his wife, he said to his wife, salary died. <laughs> salary died. So wife said, go tell the boss. So she went, he went and said, boss, Boss, salary died. Boss said, when I gave you salary, salary was alive. <laughs> salary was alive. Huh? Because animals are perishable. They can die. They can fall ill. If you use animals as money, you could have a mountain of problems on your head. And so animals were never used as money. Since animals were not used as money, you can have an exchange of four camels for one, or 20 camels for one. Now then, we've introduced you to Sunnah money. Now let us explain what are the functions of money. Hmm? I need a haircut. And my wife says to me, Imran, I'm tired cutting your hair. Why don't you go to the barber? So I went to the barber, 
Barber cut my hair. I've got to pay him now. So I offer him a copy of my book, Prohibition of Riba, in the Quran and Sunnah. The barber, the barber looked at me with a very strange look on his face. He said, Sheikh, I am afraid I'm not interested in reading your book. How can I pay him? This is called barter. Barter has its limitations. Hmm? As they found out in Yugoslavia, as they're finding out in, in, in Indonesia now, barter has its limitations. What I need is money, something which can function as a medium of exchange. I pay him for the haircut with money. He goes to the market and he buys tomatoes with money. That vendor comes, he buys my book, Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah, with money. This is now money functioning as a medium of exchange. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who created us with needs which cannot be satisfied, except through buying and selling, must also have created money which can function as a medium of exchange. Sunnah money perform that function successfully. Yes, I know somebody will argue that it was not as convenient to have dates as money as it is to have some pieces of paper in your wallet. I know that argument. But the, the, the fact is that Sunnah money functions successfully as a medium of exchange. Second function of money. Second function of money. Every single home I went to in South Africa, every single home, it was a black woman. A black woman. As a domestic servant. Yeah. And she was working from morning until night. For the whole month. A black woman. So I scratched my head and I said, if that is Islam, if that is Islam, I need to do some work here. Huh? That couldn't possibly be Islam. In every single home, a black woman, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four, as domestic servants, working from morning to night. That's a recipe for disaster. How much shall we pay her? for her labor. One of the functions of money now must be to be functioning as a measure, a value. What is the value of the labor of that woman? She works for the whole month and a unit which she understands is a bag of corn. They call it mealy, huh? the staple diet of the African people in Southern Africa. So maybe 40 bags of corn, maybe five or 10 she would use for eating, another five she'd use for clothing, another five she'd use for transport and so on. 40 bags of corn would be a measure of her value of the labor. But then there's a third function of money. So long as we use sunnah money, sunnah money functions successfully as a medium of exchange and as a faithful measure of value so that she always got what would be a just wage. But there's a third function of money. If I work for the whole month and I get a salary with which I can buy a camel, you remember? And I take that money home, and I say to my wife, put it away. 10 years later, when I take it out, it should still be able to buy the camel. 20 years later, it should still be able to buy the camel. In other words, this money should faithfully preserve my one month of sweat. And Sunnah money did that. 
all through history. Now let me introduce you to something very sinister that occurred. It not, in fact, it was more than something haram, it was riba. But the Prophet had said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, about the riba which would come with Dajjal. What did he say? He said that it will be as difficult to recognize it as it would be to recognize a black ant on a black stone on a dark night. I mean, you don't need a PhD from the University of New South Wales to recognize. The only man who can see that ant, the black ant, on the black stone, on the dark night, is the one who has some light. You don't need a PhD to understand that. Huh? Nobody else can recognize it. Nobody else, not even with a PhD from Al-Azhar University. You cannot recognize it unless you have noor. And guess what? It isn't sold in the stock market. Noor. Yahdillahu li noorihi man yasha. Allah guides to his noor whomsoever Allah wishes to guide. Suddenly, strangely, something happened. Europe is empowered with a power which the rest of the world combined cannot match. If you think this happened by accident, you should go and buy a house in Disneyland. <laughs> yes, that's where you should go and live. Europe is empowered for the first time in its history with a power which the rest of the world combined cannot match. And Europe uses that power to attack the rest of the world and colonize it. If you think that happened by accident, go and live in Disneyland. When Europe colonized, it was something very sinister going on. It was made even more sinister because suddenly one day Europe started to withdraw. They call it decolonization. And as Europe decolonized, the natives now, they have something that they call, I don't know if you heard about it, independence. <laughs> huh? Independence. And they have a flag, and they have a national anthem, huh? and they have a hodgepodge of an army and so on. And then sometime in the middle of the night, they would have the lowering of the flag and the raising of the flag and they'll be dancing and so on. And they say, we've got, we've got freedom. But the European will be hiding behind a mango tree and laughing his belly out. Look at these one-eyed fools. They think they have got freedom. <laughs> that they drove Europe out. No, Europe withdrew for tactical and strategic reasons. But before Europe withdrew, decolonized, Europe planted some tr truly dangerous seeds. But the only way you could recognize those dangerous seeds is if you have nur from Allah, not just knowledge that you get from the books. That's important. Yes, that is important, but you need something more than that. The first seed that Europe planted, of course, I told you about it already in my lecture on Imam al-Mahdi and the return of the Khilafah. Hmm? That it is in the essence of Islam that you must recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al-Malik. The one who possesses al-Mulk, sovereignty. That's the translation for Mulk, sovereignty. But now Europe leaves behind a dangerous seed called the modern secular state. And the modern secular state declares 
we no longer recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al-malik the state is now al-malik sovereign and that is shirk and I explained to you the same thing about power al-akbar and the same thing about al-hakam the one whose law is supreme so go back to that lecture and you'll understand this so this was the seed of shirk political shirk which was planted how many Muslims saw it and recognized it? How many of our distinguished and learned ulama for whom we have respect? We don't speak disrespectfully of them, not at all. How many of them recognized that this was shirk? We even had ulama in politics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ulama in politics. We even had Islamic movements becoming a political party and fighting in elections like everybody else. Still going on now. Incapable of seeing the shirk of the modern secular state. I told you about my arguments with Taliban, and I couldn't succeed in getting Taliban and his ulama to understand this point. But the second seed that Europe planted before withdrawing was the seed of transformation of money. Money was no longer going to be sunnah money, money which had intrinsic value, but rather we now have a new kind of money, it's paper money, and it does not possess intrinsic value. The value of the money is outside of the money. And so now I'm paid my salary in paper. And I am told, Imran, this is very convenient. You can, you can put it in your, in your ass. You can slip it in easily in your wallet. Paper, huh? very convenient. So I got my salary in paper. It could buy a camel. Took it home, gave it to my wife, put it away. Five years later, take it out, can't buy a camel anymore, can only buy a donkey now. <laughs> Did you hear that? Can only buy a donkey now. My one month of sweat is now reduced. Only two weeks have been kept in the money. And two weeks of my sweat has disappeared. Is this permissible in Islam? Allah speaks in the Quran in connection with a prophet whose name was Shu'aib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Bismillahi awwaluhu wa akhiru. My one month of sweat has now been reduced to two weeks. Okay? What does Allah say about this in the Quran? It's there in the Quran. It's there. But we don't notice it. <laughs> the Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam and the market or the economy of the people of Shu'aib alayhi salam is a corrupted market. There's a lot of ripping off going on in this market. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to it in the Quran and he declares three times in the Quran. Listen to the words. وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشِيَاءَهُمْ do not do this. My one month is now reduced to two weeks. Do not diminish and make less the value of people's property, people's labor, etc. That is haram. And so this money which is losing value 
is by the definition of the Quran haram. <laughs> but we were asleep. Let me conclude myself in it so nobody will be angry with me. We were all asleep. And we didn't recognize that we were being taken for a ride. But had it been an African American, you must have heard his name, a man named Malcolm X. Oh, he used to see with two eyes. <laughs> oh, yes. Had it been Malcolm, Malcolm would have asked, who took my money? And how did they take it? Hmm? And then it would have become clear that my loss was somebody else's gain. Let me repeat that. When my money could no longer buy a camel, it could only buy a donkey. The value of my labor has been diminished by half. My loss was somebody else's gain. Five years later, when I take it out, can't buy a donkey anymore. Can only buy a goat now. And so my one month has now been diminished to one week. If this keeps on going on, I'm going to be enslaved. A new slavery will come upon the world. If this keeps on going on like this, Surely it was time for the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam to stop fighting amongst themselves over popcorn. Because that's what they're doing. Fighting over popcorn. While this massive betrayal of Islam is taking place and we are blissfully ignorant of it. That's the price we pay. When we only have scholarship but no nur. Five years later, when you, when you take out that money, can't buy a goat anymore. You only buy chicken and chips. <laughs> That's where Indonesia is now. That is where Indonesia is now, chicken and chips. That's where Turkey is now, chicken and chips. Yes. And still we're fighting over Popcorn. Eh? If you're 17 years of age tonight, son and daughter, this lecture is for you. They've been fighting over popcorn. While the slavery has come upon us. The Indonesian rupiah is now trading at about 10 to 11,000 rupiah to one US dollar. And you'd want to know, well, why is the relationship the value of the money always linked to the US dollar. We'll explain to you that tonight. When the Indonesian rupiah collapsed three years ago, dramatically, there was nothing wrong with the Indonesian economy. The International Monetary Fund of the World Bank just two or three months earlier had given a clean bill of health to the Indonesian economy. Nothing significant had changed in that economy when George Soros and, and company attacked hmm? and the banking centers around Indonesia attacked. Singapore, let's put it into the record tonight, is one of them. The Indonesian rupiah collapsed overnight. It was trading, I think, about 8,000 and it fell to 20,000 within a matter of one week. And more than a half of the population of Indonesia were instantaneously reduced to poverty. There is such massive poverty in Indonesia today that the country is riddled with violence. And our sisters, oh, let's put it, my sister and my daughter and my mother must now sell her body for one dollar. It's very cheap now. One dollar. Yeah. It's happening. While those fellows are fighting over popcorn. 
What about Turkey? It's not by accident that Indonesia was attacked. It's not by accident by, that Turkey was attacked like this. Because the Indonesian is different. He's a warrior. He's a fighter. He'll give his life for Islam, the Indonesian. And the Turkish Muslim in the villages are like that. They love the deen and they'll fight for it and they'll give their lives for it. But Israel needs Turkey. Israel needs the water of Turkey. And Israel needs the support and the alliance of the Turkish military of Mustafa Kemal. So in order for the military to take control of the country, and in order for Israel to get that supply of water from Turkey, you've got to enslave the Turkish masses. So do you know what is the value of the Turkish lira now? At what is it trading? Do you know? It is trading at 1.5 million, 1.5 million Turkish liras to one US dollar. Now, don't you think this is an important subject to teach? Yeah. Yes. And there are those who now will have to teach this subject after I leave Australia. Yeah. Five years later, we take out the money, can't buy chicken and chips anymore. No? You don't believe me? It's coming. It's coming. It's around the corner. You can't buy chicken and chips with it anymore. You can use it as wallpaper. The collapse of the international monetary system based on paper money with no intrinsic value, that collapse is around the corner. How do I know that? Not only because I was blessed with the opportunity to study international monetary economics at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, Switzerland. I know that because of something else. I know it because of the Quran and the Hadith, that the collapse of the international monetary system is around the corner. When it all collapses, and we'll come back to this, what will be money? What are you going to have as money? When the Australian dollar collapses, and of course if you had any Australian dollars underneath your pillow, hiding away, hidden away, you can use it as wallpaper. Yeah. What is going to be money after that? Answer is, no, not gold, and not silver, and not dates. It's going to be electronic money. Electronic impulses in machines, in banks. Machines without minds. Artificial intelligence. Huh? The plastic you'll use to access the money, but the plastic itself would not be the money. The money is going to be electronic money. So listen to this. I don't know whether you'll be able to digest your dinner now after this. Money is going to disappear. You won't be able to see money anymore. You, you won't be able to see money anymore. You won't be able to touch money anymore. It's gone. Electronic impulses in min mindless machines in banks. We're not concerned with who owns the banks. We're concerned with who controls the banking system around the world. And it is not an uncharitable statement to make. It is a factual statement that the European Jews control the banking system around the world. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the subject of your enemy. And listen to what he says. Had this not been in the Quran, oh, they would sue me. Latajidan, time and again you will find 
اشد الناس عداوه للذين امنوا اليهود time and again you will find that those who will have the greatest hatred and hostility and enmity for you will be the jews ila akhir al ayah and so your worst enemy now controls money All he has to do is to go to his laptop computer and type in a little bit, and he puts one trillion dollars in his account. Who's there to stop him? Governments? No, the governments don't control money anymore. Is there any world policeman to arrest him? Hey, what did you do? This is fraud. You just made money like this. Are you God? Only Allah Subhanahu who can create wealth. You did nothing. All you did was to type with your fingers like this, and you put a whole billion dollars in your account. No one can stop them. No one can stop them. And so they control money, and they can do what they want now with money. And they will use that control and that power now to establish what will now be. a new financial slavery and it also has blackmail in it because they can see everybody's account they know how much money there is in a community they never knew it before they know who has the money they never knew it before you could have concealed what money you have They know how much money he has. They never knew it before. But most important of all, they know how you're using your money. Yes. If they see in the records that you're using your money to buy whiskey, they know they don't have any problem with you. Or you're using your money to pay for prostitutes. We have any problems with him? But when they see that you're using that money to fulfill your obligation of participating in the jihad, which is already in force, to liberate the Holy Land and to liberate the land of Khorasan, and you have an obligation, a religious obligation, to participate in a jihad when it is in force. This is not for Ain. This is for this is not for Kifaya. This is for Ain. When you are not called upon to go and fight yourself, because the leaders of the jihad are not asking for that, they are asking you to send money. They are asking you to assist them with weapons and so on. And now you want to send money, and they see that you are using your account to do that. Guess what they'll do with your account? You don't need a PhD to answer this one. they'll declare you a terrorist and seize your account or they'll freeze your account can they do that guess what happened about 2 3 months ago in argentina do you know what happened the government of argentina froze all bank accounts all in argentina for a whole month and got away with it and the jews have a tremendous stranglehold over the argentinian economy powerful influence over the argentinian economy mm -hmm. this is what happened and so we have a very dangerous future lying just around the corner and woe unto a people who have eyes but cannot see Woe unto a people who have ears but they cannot hear. Woe unto a people who have hearts but they cannot understand. The grave danger which is around the corner. Allah says of such people who have eyes but they can't see, who have ears but they can't hear, who have hearts but they cannot understand. He says of such people, ulaika kal anam. They're just like cattle. Balhumadal, 
Rather, they're worse than cattle. They're more misguided than cattle. How did this happen to us? What is the plan and the strategy of the enemy who has brought this upon us? When did this all start? Paper money started essentially like a check. You write a check, huh? Yeah. You want a BMW, you write a check for the BMW. Provided, of course, that you have money in the account, then you can get the BMW, write a check. But you took the BMW and you're driving down the road, and when they went to cash the check, you got no money in your account. This is called fraud. You'll be arrested and put in jail. <laughs> you're writing a check, and it cannot be cashed, because you have no money in your account? That's fraud. This check will have validity if the check can be cashed for value. Then it would be halal. This is how paper money started. It started in Britain, the island of Tamimodari. Yes. The British created something called the Bank of England in the 17th century. And towards the end of the century, century, 17th century, the Bank of England issued the first paper money. And I've seen it myself. The picture of it is written exactly like a check. So long as this check, this currency now, let's use this word, so long as this currency was redeemable, meaning you could cash it. You could get the gold for it. It was halal. But guess what? Every businessman knows this. A man comes to your shop or to your store to buy goods. Would you accept a check from him without knowing him? No. He has to be a man whose character, whose integrity, and whose record is established. Or someone has to vouch for him. Okay? Then we can accept a check from him. Or the other alternative, we must know who he is. So that if the check cannot be cashed, we send the police for him. And when they send police for him, he'll be arrested and put in jail. Yes, then we could accept a check from you. But those who are now issuing the checks, are they a people we can trust? Hmm? No. These are the people who are now empowered with a power which is strange and mysterious. And they use this power for blatant oppression and aggression. Are these the people you can do business with? They send their armies and they colonize the rest of the world. And then they rip mankind of their resources. Yeah? With the heart of beasts. Yeah? If ever there was a European who didn't have the heart of a beast, he could never make it to the top. No. He will never become part of government. <laughs> He will never be in charge of the armed forces. This decent man who has a human heart, he will never, never make it to the top. The European civilization is now taken over by people who now control it and who have the hearts of beasts. And I have recognized them in previous lectures. You're dealing with Gog and Magog now. Stage two occurred after the end of the Second World War. Very interesting things happened before that. But I don't want to keep you here until 11 o'clock, so let's cut out part of it. You can get it in this book here, Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah. And let me take you go straight to the end of the Second World War. <laughs> the European powers who were victorious they now called 
an international monetary conference and invited the rest of the world to attend. It was held in a place in upstate New York called Bretton Woods. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were Muslim countries present. Saudi Arabia was there. Mm -hmm. It was held in 1944. And out of the negotiations of Bretton Woods emerged the Bretton Woods Agreement, which created a new international monetary system. Two important things were agreed upon at Bretton Woods. Number one, prepare yourself for it. Not all checks can be cashed. Only one check. Which one? The US dollar. Only this currency can be redeemed for gold at $35 an ounce. So this is halal. But all the rest of the paper money in the world are now checks which cannot be cashed. You could exchange them for the US dollar, check for check, but you cannot cash them. That's the first agreement at Bretton Woods. And so now it's plain. This system is 99% haram, only 1% halal. That is the US dollar, which the US government has promised that if you come with US dollars, we will convert it for you to gold at $35 an ounce. We gave our word to you, and we will keep our word, and we put it on the US dollar. Did you see it? In God we trust? Ever saw it? Hmm. The second thing that came out of the Bretton Woods Agreement was that not every individual can take his US dollars to have it converted into gold, redeemed. No, 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 no. Only governments, only central banks can do it, not individuals. So are we not a part of the market? This system is now 99.9% .9 haram. It is only 0.1% halal, meaning that a government can go to the United States and say, here are US dollars that we have. We want you to redeem it for gold at $35 an ounce. You gave your word, now keep your word. So 0.1% halal. This is the Bretton Woods Agreement. And it lasted from 19, uh, 1944 until 1971. Some of you, I believe, must have been born already by 1971. Hmm? In 1971, September 1971, the British government, island of Tamim Budari, the British government came in one Friday evening to Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam is the US government. And said, Uncle Sam, we got three billion US dollars here. We want to cash these checks. You promised on the Bretton Woods, you promised to do it. Three billion US dollars to be redeemed into gold at $35 an ounce. Suddenly, Richard Nixon couldn't digest his food anymore. Why? Because he had written more checks than he had money in his account. If I did that, or Sheikh Files did that, they would arrest us. But who can arrest Uncle Sam? <laughs> if he gave the gold to Britain, then Monday morning, who is going to be at the front of the line? Saudi Arabia? Because they got a mountain of checks for all the oil they've been selling. Hmm? And they will say, if the British wanted the gold, we better go and do it quickly. But Uncle Sam didn't have the gold to redeem all that US dollars. So uh, uh, Uncle Sam retired to Camp David, <laughs> Richard Nixon. And then on Sunday, he addressed the world, and he said, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep it. 
And so the Bretton Woods Agreement collapsed in September 1971. After the collapse of the Bretton Woods Agreement, the world of paper money is now 100% haram. Surely, the world of Islam would recognize that. Surely, the ulama of the world of Islam would recognize that. But no, it was not to be. Illa, masha Allah. It was not to be. Between 1971 and 1973, an ominous thing was happening. From $35 to an ounce, it started to move to 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. And by 1973, it had reached 40. In October 1973, the war took place with Israel. And King Faisal, for whom we always say Rahimahullah, imposed an oil boycott on the United States. You remember? And then all the Arab oil producing states, they also joined in the oil boycott. Guess what happened to the US dollar? It collapsed by 400% overnight. From 40 to 160. Why? I ask this question. Why? Because of an oil boycott. Why should this happen? And then on the 15th of January 1980, the same thing happened again. Iran had had a revolution and the Iranian people took control of their oil. More than that, they were threatening to export their revolution into the Gulf, where the oil is located. And then at the end of December 1979, the then Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and took over the country. And Wall Street knew the reason why. Wall Street knew that the Soviet Union has done this because of fear of the threat posed by the revolution in Iran. And so Wall Street had their greatest fears confirmed. And on the 15th of January 1980, the US dollar collapsed to $850 to an ounce of gold. So we asked the question, why did this happen? There was no economic cause to explain it. None. The US economy was the largest economy in the world. Oil accounted for only 4% of the US economy. And the United States had enough oil underground to meet most of its own domestic needs. The United States preferred to keep its oil underground and get oil from Saudi Arabia and other countries. Because this oil which was kept underground became a strategic reserve. And the oil that they got from Saudi Arabia was free of charge. You didn't have to pay for it. Did you hear that? Huh? Did you hear that? It was free. All that Uncle Sam has to do is to write checks that nobody could cash. Uh, one BMW, please. Here's a check. Uh, can I have a Mercedes, please? Here's a check. <laughs> I have no money in my account. Or oh, even if I have money in my account, you can't cash it. So all I'm doing is writing checks. And that's how they're buying the Saudi oil with US dollars, which cannot be redeemed. They're just like checks which cannot be cashed. Well, then why did the US dollar collapse? There's only one answer. Only one answer. Only one. And that is that Wall Street knew what even our distinguished and respected ulama did not know. 
Wall Street knew that this entire international monetary system was fraudulent, bottle, and that it would collapse one day. And they thought that that day had come. In 73, and again in 80. And so a Wall Street banker would not ask, would the international monetary system ever collapse? No, he wouldn't ask that question. What's the question he will ask? When would it collapse? That's what he would ask. Since 1980, something strange has been happening. And that is that there has not been any more collapses. The US dollar in relationship to gold has remained fairly stable for 22 years now. The price of the US dollar, the value of the US dollar in relation to gold has been moving between say 250 and $400, up and down, up and down, okay? but no collapse. Why is this happening? The answer is, those who have constructed this system, those who are preparing to bring down this system, and to then take absolute control of the world of money, as part of the means through which they will now rule the world, rule the world. And the golden age would be said to have come back again. And so the Messiah must be here. They're the ones for that subject, of course, please read this book, Jerusalem in the Quran. It'll explain that subject. What they did was to control the price of gold. Can you control the price of a commodity? Yes, if you can establish what is called a monopoly. Then you can control the price of a commodity. The Prophet cursed the one who establishes a monopoly. In, uh, in the late 19th century, when diamonds were discovered in southern Africa. Hmm? The Jews were behind the diamond industry, the European Jews. And they wanted to take control of the diamonds, and they wanted to maintain the high price, so that the price would not lower. So what they did, they used, of course, a British as a front man, so that Jewish face would not be on, up front. His name was Cecil John Rhodes. Cecil John Rhodes. And using Cecil John Rhodes, of course, the Jew is behind him. Alfred Beat is the Jew behind him. And behind Alfred Beat is Lord Rothschild in Europe, a Jewish banker. What they did was to buy out all the other diamond mines. And those which could not be bought out, they got them to come together in one amalgamated company, which was called De Beers Consolidated. And once they did that, they were able to maintain stability in the price of diamonds at the level that would give them the maximum return. And so this is what has been happening to gold. Not for the purpose of keeping the price high, no. For the purpose of keeping the system from collapsing. We don't want it to collapse on its own. We want to bring it down when it will be in the interest of the State of Israel. That's where we are today, brothers and sisters. This is the history of what has happened since the first paper money was issued. The attack on America on September the 11th is the opening rounds, I have warned you time and again, the opening rounds of the countdown 
will, will, which will witness the transfer of power from one ruling state to another, from the United States of America to the state of Israel. How does Imran Hussein know this? Where does he get this knowledge? Brother, the hadith is there. We've used it as the cover of this book. Sure, you can defer with me. I have no problem with that if you defer with me. That I have interpreted the hadith in the way that I have, and you are uncomfortable with it. Fine. But well, what are you going to do when Israel becomes the ruling state of the world? You'll remember me on that day, yes? Yeah? Imran was right. He interpreted the hadith correctly. Part of the process through which the Jews will take control of the world is the attack with money. This is riba. With the value of the money collapsing, going down lower and lower, she was working, you remember, for 40 bags? The black woman? And then the white South African government was slapped in the face by the U.S. Congress in 1988. Why? Because the white world order, they don't want to look bad. And this was an eyesore in South Africa. So they wanted to get rid of this apartheid because it was embarrassing them. So they slapped economic sanctions on South Africa in 1988. And then the South African RAND collapsed. It was 1.9, it went to 3. RANDs to the dollar. And the woman who was working for 40 bags of mealy meal or corn, she's now getting 20 bags. Huh? And then when the black government gave way, the white government gave way to the black government, 91 or 92, huh? the South African ran had some color consciousness in it. Because as soon as the black government took power, it dropped from three rands to six rands. Strange things happening, eh? And then when September 11 took place, two aeroplanes hit two towers, and the South African ran thousands of miles away, fell from six to nine. And so she was working for 40 bags of mealy meal. And then it went to 20, and now it went to 10. And then about a month or two ago, I don't know, it reached up to 12 rands to one US dollar before the South African government established a commission inquiry to find out where is this thief? <laughs> and who is the thief? And so this is riba. This is riba. Why? Because of the verse of the Quran, وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ Do not diminish, make little the value of people's property, people's labor, people's sweat. It's haram. It is riba because of the hadith. If you rip off somebody, then that's riba. This is a rip off. When The moment is appropriate. The U.S. Congress has declared that Jerusalem must be recognized as the capital of the state of Israel. Of course, Bush can make a lot of noise. It doesn't make any difference. This is naturally going to cause tremendous anger, even amongst those governments in the Arab world who shine Mr. Bush's shoes for him. Huh? Even they will become angry. <coughs> and then Israel launches a missile in Gaza and kills about 12, 14, and injures about 110. Any country in the world today which had done that, the matter would have been in the UN Security Council already. 
The whole world would have been debating it. Send an army in this country. But Israel has done it. And Israel gets away with it. The reason for this is because there's a deliberate policy at work to get the anger of the Arab masses to reach boiling point. When they are convinced that it is now boiling point, that any little spark will catch the fire, then Mr. Bush must attack Iraq. When the attack on Iraq takes place, among the things that will result would be the collapse of some governments they are hoping. Which one, first of all? Abdullah in Jordan, which is why he's got his suitcases packed already. <laughs> the West, which controls the media around the world, will now use the media for a, a, a crusade, media crusade, declaring that the world of Islam is now rising up to cut the throats of the Jews. The Jews are now faced with the most perilous moment in their history. I told you two, three nights ago, I said this is going to be drama worthy of Hollywood when it happens. And there will be even Muslims who are going to be convinced by it. Huh? It is at that time when the world is looking to Israel, what are you going to do? You've got to do something. Otherwise, these Muslims are going to cut your throat. It is then that Israel says, okay, we're just launching a preemptive strike. But it's not going to be a preemptive strike. It is going to be the war which has already been planned long, long ago. It's going to be a lightning strike with the use of a military power unmatched in history. Dazzling war, it's called. And they will seize the oil of the Middle East. And the territory of the state will expand. Maybe that that will be the knock which will bring down the whole system, monetary system. When the US dollar collapses and the rest of the world of paper money collapses, the United States can no longer function as the ruling state in the world. I anticipated, I said to you, that the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank would then disappear. That was a mistake on my part. No. All that they'll have to do is to reduce the status of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank so they become more like small institutions which do not have any global uh, role to play. And power will now shift from Washington to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And now Israel will rule the world. I have used the hadith that when Dajjal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week, and the rest of his days like your days. To explain that the first day, it is Britain, which is the headquarters of Dajjal, using the hadith of Tamim Udari. But I said, this is my opinion. You're free to disagree with me. But if you want to disagree with me, close the door. You can't leave. No, you can't leave. If I'm wrong, you're going to tell me what the right answer is. The island of Tamim Udari. If it is not Britain, tell me which island it is. Then I said, if Britain is the island in a day which is like a year, then a day which is like a month, it's the United States of America. And then a day which is like a week, be the state of Israel. And at the end of that would come a day which is like our day. So he'd be in our dimension of time. So now he appears, he's a Jew, he's a young man, he's powerfully built, he has curly hair. But I say nothing about his eyes. Hmm? Why? Because when he sees with one eye, this symbolizes external vision. When he's blind in the other eye, this, re this represents internal blindness. So no one can understand Dajjal. No one can recognize the strategies of Dajjal, whether it be the political strategy or the economic strategy 
all the strategy involved in the world of women, the feminist revolution, no one can understand it. Unless in addition to external observation and rational inquiry, he also has nur in his heart with which to see. The question is asked, Sheikh Imran, how can we get that nur? I have only one answer to give to you tonight. And listen carefully and ponder over it, because I'm not going to say anything more than this. If you want nur, why don't you go back in the pages of the book on history? Go back in the pages of the book of history and see who are those who were blessed with nur in our 14 years of history. That's all I have to say. Nothing more than that. Israel now rules the world for a day which is like a week and then the Dajjal appears and when the Dajjal appears we have the Imam and then the confrontation and then the son of Mary and the Dajjal is killed and Gog and Magog are destroyed and then the army from Khorasan and this state of Israel is destroyed and then the Holy Land is liberated and Islam will now rule the world from Jerusalem. Good. Now then, what do we do in the meantime? Do we sit down and wait for the Imam al-Mahdi? No. Because jihad is already in force. We don't need any fatwa. The jihad is already in force in the Holy Land. And we already know that two out of every three who fight in that jihad will be killed. Two out of every three will enter into heaven. That's the better way to say it. So those who live for Allah, Bushra lahum, because they will die for Allah. Don't let any government change your mind. What do we do in the meantime? How do we survive in the new world of money? Hmm? If we had it under the pillow, it's gone, now it's wallpaper. If we had it in the bank and we use it in a manner pleasing to Allah, they're seizing all the accounts, freezing it, what are we going to do? We won't even have money to buy chicken and chips. The answer is simple. Any time you commit sin, the sin of abandoning the Quran, which we have done, the sin of abandoning the Sunnah, which we have done, we recognize that tonight, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knocks on the door of our heart and he says, Tubu ilallah. Tubu ilallah tawbatan nasuha. Turn to Allah. Turn away from the sin. And when you turn, turn with sincerity. Turn with integrity. Don't turn watching behind your back. I'm turning away from it. To turn away from sin is to turn away to turn towards the Quran and Sunnah. If you have a better answer, let me know. If you're uncomfortable with this, you need not have come tonight. You could have stayed home. You wasted your time. To turn away from this sin, we have to recover the Sunnah. Yeah? We have to recover the Sunnah which we abandon. The Sunnah money which we abandon. Toba. We seek forgiveness, O oh Allah, for what we did. And we're going to recover this sunnah. Whoever is uncomfortable with that, you need not have come tonight. You've wasted your time. You can stay home. Go find, listen to some other maulana. But for those in whose hearts there is now pain and sadness, 
that we have betrayed the Quran and we have betrayed the Sunnah. And we want to make amends. We must recover the Sunnah money. Question, can we recover Sunnah money while having control over territory so as government we can reintroduce this Sunnah money? Can we do it? My answer is, you need not accept it, my answer is it is impossible to take control of territory anywhere on the face of the earth today in the name of Islam and restore the Sunnah money as the official money of that market. Impossible. Why do I say it's impossible? Because I have interpreted the Quran and Hadith to the, end, to the understanding that those who today control the world are the world power of Gog and Magog. You differ with me? Fine. Go ahead. Wage your revolutionary struggle, and I will admire you while you're doing that. Take control of a territory, and when you have the control of a territory, then you bring back the Sunnah money. All right? Now then. If you agree with me that it is not possible to restore the Sunnah money at the level of state and government, is there any alternative? The answer is the macro option is not available, the micro option is available. And that is the Muslim village. If you go and find land where land is cheap and where there is water, and you build a village which is small and does not threaten the state. No. And in that village you have a market. In that market you bring back the Sunnah money. Okay, we're doing it in Indonesia, in the island of Java. And we have a shortage of gold and silver coins. What are we going to use as money? Rice, of course. Rice. Okay. We're building the Muslim village in Durban, outside of Durban, in Natal, in South Africa. And we have a shortage of gold and silver money. What are we going to use as money? Sugar! Can we use mangoes? No, we can't use mangoes. Sheikh, your money is rotting. Your money is rotting, Sheikh. No. And so if we have a shortage of gold and silver, we can use commodities. But listen to the hadith with which we'll end. Because I've spoken already on the Muslim village, and inshallah I'll be writing on this subject. When in, in Cape Town in Ramadan, I hope I can finish it. Inshallah. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold and every 100 who fight for that gold out of every 100 99 will be killed <laughs> and every one of the 100 will be saying I am the one who will be saved he said the believers must not touch that gold there's a second hadith and you will find these are hadith in this book, the prohibition of riba in the Quran and Sunnah. He said that the earth will vomit from its liver columns of gold and columns of silver. And so there's a massive amount of gold and silver that is going to come. He said that the Messiah, when he comes back, Isa alayhi islam, and the, the Imam, will be sharing wealth. You think it's paper dollars? What kind of money they'll be giving? US dollars? Oh, you must be joking. No, Sunnah money. Sharing wealth to such an extent that a man who wants to give zakat or give charity can't find anybody who would accept it. This is the tomorrow which is coming for those who hold on during this darkest hour of the night. Allah says in the Quran, Fala tahinu. Do not give up. Do not despair. Do not throw in the towel. Wa tad'u ila salm. 
and go and make some kind of a patchwork arrangement with those in control. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. No. When you should rather be making that effort which will give you that power with which you will, be have, you will have the upper hand over them. Wallahu ma'akum. And in that struggle, Allah is with you, not with them. a'malakum. And Allah will not allow your effort to be in vain. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless all those who tonight make tawbah and commit themselves to the struggle to recover the sunnah money. Before we end, I want you to sit down. Our sisters have complained in the previous nights they never had a chance to go to buy the books and the videos and so on. So tonight, if it is possible, please allow the sisters to go while the question and answer session is going on. So sisters, you all can go now. And if you want to buy any books, you can get them now. Please sit down, please sit down, please sit down. All right, secondly, this here has a very nice history. This is a CD. This is a CD of the book Jerusalem in the Quran. It's not an audio, it's not a video. It is the book itself that you read. There's an Egyptian brother, a beautiful Egyptian brother in Kuala Lumpur who lost his job. He has a wife, he has two children. And we got some money and my wife took that money and gave it to him. Take this money and buy the empty CDs. Put the book into the CD form as an electronic book. Mm -hmm. He did that. I said, okay, now I'm going to get these CDs sold for you and whatever money we get, we bring it back for you. Because sometimes he doesn't have money to even buy milk for his children. These CDs are still there. If we can get them all sold out tonight, I'd be so happy because I can take this money to that brother in Kuala Lumpur and hand it to him. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim wa tuba alayna ya maulana inna ka anta tawab rahim. Barahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. If you have any questions, please keep sitting while the sisters are doing their purchases. If you have any questions, send the questions up. You portray, you portray the Ottoman Empire as the golden age of Islam. That is not true. I do not do that. What I did was to say that the institution of the Khilafah survived until 1924, even though the seat of the Khilafah had become Mulukia or monarchy. I never said that the Ottoman Empire represented the golden age of Islam. This is not correct. Why are Muslims, why are Muslims and even muftis and shuyukh so vociferous and so vocal about interests and the banking system, and yet they are themselves the first in the key for government grants, for funding, for child allowances, for spouse allowances, for school funding, and a lot. Let me quote a hadith. You will do me a great favor, brothers, if you'll be quiet. Let me quote a hadith. I quoted this hadith in Perth. And a Muslim brother got very angry. <laughs> but I love him. He recited the Quran very beautifully. He got up and he, he, he went after me with very powerful language in Perth. <laughs> Listen to the hadith. It is in the Sunan of Tirmizi. The question is, why are some ulama behaving in this way? Hmm? It is in the Sunan of Tirmizi. It is narrated by Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, 
Listen carefully to the hadith. Yushiku an ya'ati ala nasi zaman. It will not be long before that time will, over, will come upon us, come upon the people. La yabqa min al-islami illa smu. When nothing will remain of Islam except the name. Wa la yabqa min al-Qur'ani illa rasmu. And when nothing will remain of the Qur'an now except the traces of the writing. Namely, the guidance which is in the Qur'an is no longer applied in society. People are not bothering about it. Masajiduhum amiratun wa hiya kharabu min al-huda. When that time comes, then those people, those people, amongst whom nothing now remains of Islam except the name, their masajid, their masajid, would be five star. <laughs> you know what's a five star masjid? But totally devoid of guidance. Those people. Not all. Ulama'uhum. Their ulama. Not all the ulama. Their ulama. Ulama'uhum sharrun nasi mimman tahta adimis sama. Their ulama would be the worst people beneath the sky. Min indihim takhrujul fitna wa fihim ta'ud. They will be the centers of fitna. A test and a trial for a people corrupting the people. And so, if you share with me the belief which I have that we are living in that age today, it is now absolutely imperative for us to seek to make a distinguish, distinction between those who are the true ulama and those who are now the worst people beneath the sky. Islamic banking systems and projects seem to fail in Pakistan, South Africa, elsewhere. Even the Saudis are now borrowing from the IMF. Is there no way for Muslim billionaires, princes and sultans to bring the true Islamic banking to the masses? I have already spoken on this subject. The Prophet to Islam prophesied that we would follow those who came before us, step by step. And even if they were to go down into a lizard's hole, he said, we will follow them into the lizard's hole. So they asked, O Messenger of Allah, who are you talking about, the Jews and the Christians? He said, who else? The Jews, long before this, established this banking system which today we call Islamic banking. What the Islamic banks are doing around the world is lending money on interest and disguising it as a sale. Yes? I have explained in other lectures how this so-called murabaha operates. I don't think it's necessary for me to repeat it here tonight. The, oh yes, we have the videos at the back on the subject of riba. We should explain to you how what they call murabaha is not murabaha, it's false. It is riba, but it's not riba through the front door. It's riba through the back door. And you can tell them, Imran Hussein said, it stinks. It's worse than riba from the front door. And they should be ashamed of themselves for this riba through the back door, the so-called Islamic banking system. However, when an Islamic bank is engaged in transactions which are halal, and they do have transactions which are halal, then that is beneficial. What we should do is to try to encourage them to make all of their transactions halal. But guess what's going to happen? If an Islamic bank removes all the haram transactions and becomes totally halal, they will destroy it. <laughs> yes, it will be destroyed. It will not be allowed to survive. Yeah. 
You have trashed publicly the gift of the palm top computer. Is this Islamic? No, I did not trash it. No, 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 no. I did not trash it. I said, if something is not of use to you, it has no uti utility for you. It is better to use that money, those resources that Allah has provided for you, use it in a manner which is productive. But you do not trash something that someone gives to you as a gift. No, you show respect for a gift, all right? The people in Cape Town who are known for their hospitality would be ashamed to hear you mock and make fun and laugh at their way of life, their homes and their mosques, and you say that you're going back to Cape Town to apologize, I hope? No. I have told them in South Africa what I told you here tonight. Yes. It is not an Imran Hussein with double standards, no. I have found a lot of Islam in South Africa. I have found a Muslim community in South Africa that, in which I have very great pride. Much better Muslims that I've found in many other parts of the world in South Africa. However, I have said to them that it is something extremely dangerous to have a black woman as a domestic servant in every home. Extremely dangerous. That it will be in your interest to try to build a multi-racial fraternity in a Muslim village where the black and the white and the brown and the yellow will live as a family. And the South African Muslim community, community has responded positively to that. And there are many now who are actively trying to establish the Muslim village in South Africa, which will bring all the races together as one family. If this is not done, then there is very grave danger awaiting the Muslim community in South Africa. Can we restore the Sunnah money individually in our daily businesses? My opinion is no. What can we do right now about using Sunnah money in today's society? The only answer that I have is that you cannot do it at the macro level. The only possible response that can su succeed is the micro level, and that is the Muslim village with the Muslim market. This is the only response I'm capable of. But if now that you have been taught the subject, if you have a better response, Please share it with me in an email. All right, let me answer five more questions because the audience is getting restless. Five more, okay? Should we go to the Muslim country to live in the hope of preserving our deen? If so, which country? If you go back to Pakistan, and you go to the cities of Pakistan, you find the same thing that you find in Sydney, no different. Same thing that you find in Manhattan, no different, okay? Because all the cities around the world today are all becoming the same, centers of godlessness. If you go out of Sydney or out of Karachi, and look for land where land is cheap and where there is water. And you don't go as one individual, but you go as a group, say a hundred families, and you start a village. Over there you have a greater chance of preserving your deen. Okay, second question. Concerning paper money being haram, do we get a sin and die with the sin of riba? because obviously at the moment we can't get out of it. Okay, the answer is located in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari. It is found in Sahih Bukhari four times, four times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Adam alayhi salam, take out the people for Jahannam. Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies and he says, out of every 1,000, take 999 for the hellfire. 
999 out of every 1,000 for the hellfire. The companions of the Prophet were dismissed. He said, Bushra alakum, good news for you. The one for, Jahan the one for Jannah will be from you. Namely, someone who follows the Quran and Sunnah. This is the only one who can survive. Do you think that the peace process will be successful, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process? No, the Prophet has spoken. The Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. لَتُقَاتِلُنَّ الْيَهُودِ That has already started. So there is no possibility of this jihad ending in any other way than victory for Islam. Should we start to buy gold now? Yes, yes, yes. If you have any savings, if you have any savings, which you're not going to be using and investing immediately, do not keep it in paper and do not keep it in the bank. If you keep it in paper, then you can prepare to use it as wallpaper. If you keep it in the bank, they will know how much you have. But if you go and buy gold, like in South Africa, they have the Kruger Rand. Hmm? If you go and buy gold, which every Manhattan banker will do <laughs> when he sees the system collapsing, then when the system collapses, you will not collapse with it. Could you please explain Modaraba and Musharaka types of transaction? Uh, where is it? The book. <laughs> He's already taken it. In this book, you'll find a description of what is Modaraba and what is Musharaka. Can you please explain whether the Islamic banking, which offer loans to purchase houses, is halal. What the Islamic bank does is to lend you money on interest to buy your house, but it is disguising it as a sale. In fact, it is a loan on interest. It is riba. It is haram. It is not riba through the front door. It is riba through the back door. And it stinks. Are there any countries in the Islamic land that could possibly be self-sufficient? At least temporarily. What is the strength of the international monetary system is directly related to the extent of a country's involvement in the system. Couldn't the Muslim countries use their resources to disengage from the international monetary system? For example, to sell your oil for gold. This is a beautiful idea. Beautiful idea. But would the government of Saudi Arabia demand gold for the oil? No, the Marines will land. <laughs> and the Saudi government will be gone. It will be history. You're a client state. There's only one country in the Muslim world today, only one, which seems to have understood that this international monetary system is fraudulent. Only one leader, and he is Dr. Mahadir of Malaysia. It is, it is curious that two of us have been lecturing on this subject in Malaysia for the last few years. Omar Vadilio of the Morabi Tun and your brother Imran. And it seems as though our lectures, because the special branch are always there, you know, to listen to our lectures, that our lectures have reached the ears of Dr. Mahadir. And so now he's seeking to introduce the Islamic dinar, the gold coin. If Dr. Mahadir restricts himself to the use of the dinar, only for international trade, the Jews may allow him to get away with it. Because it will only be trade between a restricted number of countries and will not affect international trade, really. But if Dr. Mahathir makes an effort 
to introduce gold and silver coins in the market as legal tender, I think they'll kill him. Where does inflation fit into all of this? When the value of paper falls, then prices rise. The rise in prices is called inflation. But the rise in prices does not occur for any other reason than the falling value of paper. When once we re remove paper money and we replace it with sunnah money, which has intrinsic value, then there will be no more inflation. Shall we stop now? Okay. One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to lead Words, pray. Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.